Hello there, and Merry Christmas if you're watching this on release date. Welcome to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series that recounts the history of the human presence in outer space, from the launch of Sputnik in 1957 to the present day. It's the 60-year anniversary of human beings going to outer space, beginning in October of 1957, last October 1957. I'm your hostess with the mostess on this flight across time and space as we retell the adventures of humankind taking its first steps out into the cosmos and the great beyond. I've got a great story ahead for y'all today as we begin part 10 of our retelling. Of 60 years of the space age. 60 years since the beginning of the human space age, we journey back to take a look at all the distances we've crossed and all the places we've been to since the launch of Sputnik on October 4th, 1957. So that was 60 years ago in 1957 from the year of 2017, which will be ending soon if you're tuning into this sometime around release date. Even though 2017 will end, as all things do, this show will carry on regardless. My plan is to finish the journey and come full circle for all 60 years of the space age by next October 4th, by next anniversary of the launch of Sputnik, marking the 61st anniversary of the space age. So do stay tuned for more. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You are now tuned in to Science Epics, 60 Years of the Space Age. In the last episode, part 9 of our story, we told the tale of the first explorers. We told the story of Laika, the Russian space dog, the first living thing from Earth that had ever ventured into space. Laika flew to space on the Sputnik 2, the follow-up spacecraft to the Sputnik 1 that started the space age in the first place. Laika's flight happened in November of 1957, just one month after the first Sputnik, and it happened in conjunction with the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Communist Revolution. So the leader of the Communist Party, what was his name? Nikita Khrushchev got on the phone and called chief designer Sergei Korolev and he was like, Bro, I need spacecraft for 40th anniversary of communist revolution in honor of Father Stalin, yo. And then Sergei Korolev is like, Bro, chill out, I got this. We put dog on spacecraft. It make us look good. Here, hold my vodka. <laughs> or something like that. But anyway... But Laika flew to space on Sputnik 2 in November of 1957. But sadly, though, she would never make it back to Earth alive, which is sad. And a lot of the people who designed the mission still have regrets up until far later after the mission. But animal testing in space exploration was necessary back in those days because we needed to study the effects of a weightless environment and rocket flight on living creatures and the animals had to boldly go before the humans could boldly go. Now in the last episode we also talked about the first American satellite in outer space, the Explorer 1. That was launched far later, a couple, several months after Sputnik, the Sputniks, the first two Sputniks. Explorer 1 was launched on the 31st of January 1958, but the Explorer 1 made some important discoveries. It ended up discovering the Van Allen belts, which are these rings of energetic particles surrounding the Earth and it, that are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. And this Van Allen belt protects our planet from the harm of high energy cosmic rays from outer space. Without the Van Allen belts, which are comprised of inner and outer belts, which are like these donut-shaped things around the Earth. You can go look it up. Donut-shaped shields around the Earth. The atmosphere of our planet would have long been stripped away to space by the solar wind, and life on Earth would be impossible. Wow, Morty, we we, we really dodged a bullet with that one. Oh, jeez, Rick. Yeah, we really did. Oh, jeez. Anyways, onwards with part 10. In this entry, we're continuing our story of the space age by taking a look 
at the formation of one of the most influential organizations that would drive forward the space frontier. Science Epic Studios? Not quite. And it still continues to advance the space frontier to this day on levels that we are proud to call amazing. I'm talking about NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States. Ah, uh, NASA, an organization that would eventually land Neil Armstrong on the moon and more importantly, help Bruce Willis to save the Earth from a giant asteroid. Seriously, that totally happened and we'll probably reserve an entire episode of 60 Years of the Space Age talking about it. You don't want to miss a thing. NASA is probably the most famous organization to have emerged from the space age in the last 60 years. It is synonymous not just in America, but also all over the world for consisting of, an, of a group of really smart and talented people dedicated towards pushing the space frontier in exciting and innovative ways. The NASA way. Since the heydays of the space age, NASA has been envisioned and commemorated across movies, television, books, and pop culture as an, as an agency that could achieve nearly anything in and beyond the open sky. I mean, they put a man on the moon for God's sake. You know the saying, if you could put a man on the moon, then you could probably do X. X being whatever near impossible task you set out to accomplish. And that saying could not exist that saying could only exist because of NASA. So therefore, if there was a difficult task in space that needed to be done, NASA could probably get it done first. And these days, they tend to do it with a fraction of the cost, since they're no longer running on their inflated Cold War budget. As for this entry in our podcast, we're jumping ahead about six months later in our story, after the launch of Werner von Braun's satellite Explorer 1 that we talked about in the last episode. The Soviet Union had proven themselves to be far more capable in the arena of space exploration than had previously thought by the U.S. government. At the time, in the 50s, America was being led by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, a Republican, which is the same party as Donald Trump, by the way, and former military man, Eisenhower had served as supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II. At first, he didn't understand why the world was so caught up in the euphoria of Sputnik and the space age. He thought that the Sputnik panic would just fade away after Explorer 1. But he was wrong. The American people and the whole world were captivated by the adventure of outer space. It was really a different time to live in. Even the music was different. The music actually sounded like music. Seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. President Eisenhower. Political standing took some blows because of the space angle. His critics in the Democratic Party, that's Obama's party, espoused the notion that space was the key to success over the Red Menace, the communists, and that first in space meant first in everything. So something had to be done if the Russians gained a foothold in space. They could threaten the security of the United States. And space became a new battleground for the two superpowers jockeying for supremacy in the post-World War II era, the Cold War era. Each side would give rise to notable heroes and magnanimous figures that would push the physical and mental boundaries of humanity. The space age would show and demonstrate and give rise to the best of humanity and, and provide people unlike any other time before. It would give rise to titans of industry, rocket inventors, and death-defying space pilots. It was a new era of exploration. Seriously. Three, two, one. And the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, would be at the forefront of it. NASA actually began as a much older organization called NACA, 
the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, established around the time of World War I. That was, the agency was already 40 years old, and they had done various experimental technologies, work on it, various experimental technologies, rockets and rocket-driven aircraft. NASA was formed in the summer of 58, 1958. That should be the name of the band, though, summer of 58. When President Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act into law on July 29th, Thomas Keith Glennon, who was the president of the Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland, Ohio, would be sworn into service as the first administrator. Hugh Dryden, formerly of the antiquated NACA, was the first deputy administrator. NASA officially opened for business on October 1st, 1958, one year after the Sputnik event. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. NASA's main missions, and I'm reading directly from the original Space Act, so bear with me as I get a little bit technical, was the expansion of human knowledge and understanding of Earth's atmosphere and space. The invention and improvement of aeronautical and space vehicle used to carry scientific instruments, equipment, supplies, and living organisms. Conduction of long-range studies on space and space technology and their potential benefit for peaceful and scientific purposes quote-unquote, peaceful and scientific. The preservation... Okay, he, here's another one, and you gotta... This is where it starts to get a bit jingoistic. The preservation of the United States as a leader in the field of aeronautical and space science technology, as a leader in atmospheric and space capability. Okay, next one. Providing national defense agencies with information and technology that may be valuable and significant. Cooperation with other nations or group of nations that pursue this similar act for peaceful applications. And finally, the optimization of scientific and engineering resources through cooperation with other agencies of the United States in order to cut costs, etc., etc. Okay, so that was a lot to take in, but there are some remarkable details in this founding charter that lay the groundwork for an organization capable of doing some really world-changing stuff. No, seriously, think about it. When you look at back at all those goals that I mentioned, there are some obvious nationalistic jingoism in there, like to help America maintain leadership in aeronautics and space and providing national defense agencies with information. Okay. But and NASA was, after all, created in order to respond to the Red Menace, the, the commie bastards, and to counter the capability of chief designer Korolev's rockets. But also, written between those lines were the makings of a civilian-run space agency that were to carry with it the goodwill and hopes and dreams of humanity to the stars. It was exactly the type of organization that was needed. Think of it as kind of like Batman. <laughs> right. Is the agency the U.S. needed, but also one that the world deserved? I think that's the Batman quote. A space agency that is essentially fighting the Cold War with technological innovations that they make and maintaining a pace that perhaps even surpasses the Russians, but also maintaining a largely peaceful agenda with a civilian front. They, they did, they made the technology and they handed it off to the military, but by and large, NASA was a public agency run by civilians. The U.S. government could have decided to establish NASA in many other ways. They could have made NASA a more militaristic venture, like ARPA, the advanced research arm of the, the DOD. That's the Department of Defense. ARPA would later go on to invent the internet that you all use every day. Think of a day in which you don't plug into the internet today. And our, the internet, combined with NASA satellites, would later change our world remarkably. One at a time, we'll talk about it when we get there. NASA could have also been founded as an agency that focused less on cooperation with other agencies, a more secretive space program, like the one the Russians had. The space program, the, the Soviet space program, was far more mired in secrecy. It was clearly a military venture. Anything they did had to get approval and direction from the generals of the army and, above that, the ruling Communist Party. Or else it's off to the gulag for you, comrade. I like doing my Russian accent. 
So in that way, Chief Designer Korolev, as driven as he was about exploring the space frontier and God bless his soul, and pushing the boundary for humanity, he had his work cut out for him because of the Soviet politics involved. There was a lot of red tape. <laughs> Get it? Red tape, because they're the Soviet Union and they're called the Reds. Bit of irony there. But anyway, NASA wasn't like that. It didn't roll that way. It was a civilian agency that actually stressed cooperation and sharing of information. So you could see which type of organization would eventually come out on top. Which type of organization is better suited for success and innovation? A more transparent agency, a more an agency that is, is promotes cooperation like that. So NASA began with five research centers. 60 years ago, NASA began with five research centers in the United States, some of which, like the renowned Ames Laboratory in California and Langley Research Center in Virginia, are still in use today. The young NASA began with 8,000 initial staffers, most of which were inherited from the old NACA. President Eisenhower granted the fledgling space agency several millions of dollars, $300 million dollars, in initial funding. That's about $2 billion in today's dinero. NASA also inherited all of the old NACA projects to begin operations. With the pieces in place for the space agency and their aspirations pointed at the sky, it was now then time to change the world. Werner von Braun, who up until this point had been working for a separate agency called the Redstone Arsenal as part of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency or ABMA in Alabama. Wow, that's a mouthful. That's where he helped build the Explorer 1. Now von Braun, who was working for the ABMA in Alabama, ABMA in Alabama, von Braun would later find himself within the following months absorbed into the larger NASA, so he would join NASA, where he would rise to prominence in the organization and become a leader in the field of rocketry within the next decade. He wasn't even an American. Think about that, President Trump, if you're watching this. Think about that. <laughs> Alongside the formation of NASA, there were also many other initiatives that were taken to respond to the Sputnik crisis. Education in the United States was given a reform. Science and technology moved to the forefront of the public eye. People wanted to become scientists and engineers because it was the cool thing to do. It was the right thing to do. So instead of going to school for gender studies and political correctness SJW bullshit, more young people took courses in sciences and technologies 60 years ago. And all of these things would help shape America to become the greatness that the current President Trump said he was going to make again. But for now, Here's where we end our story, with America poised to take back the realm of the stars from the Russians. Not with a military action, not with a military organization, but with the action of civilian individuals united, civilian individuals being people like you and me, united under a common cause of peaceful exploration of the stars. Makes you wish you were a part of that adventure, doesn't it? But the adventure continues next time on Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age. Whoosh! If you enjoy this type of work and wish to see it continue, support us by donating to us on Patreon. Follow us on Facebook and our usual social media, and I will be truly grateful. I'm trying to build momentum for this initiative. This story will continue and I am picking up the skills to make it better and better with each podcast entry. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.